Hi, this is Tracy Stuckrath with Thrive Meetings and Events, and I'm excited to do, be doing an Instagram Live session with you today and introducing you to your um, sh chef, Joel Schaefer. And let's see, I'm gonna, let's see, I'm gonna add him in here. Let's do this again. Um, view, let's do this. Go, chefs. Okay, perfect, so he's coming on right now. And where I look very bright, I'm sitting with in front of a window. Hey, Joel. Hey, good morning. How are you? I'm doing good. Let me get a little yeah. bit of light on I'm the subject. Like, I am like bright light because I'm <laughs> sitting in front of a window. Um, so everybody, I'm Tracy Starquest with Thrive Meetings and Events, and I provide education on how to provide on how to create. Um, safe and inclusive food and beverage experiences, and that includes how to serve people who have food allergies. And then with me today, I'm so excited, is Chef Joel Schaefer from Your Allergy Chefs. And gosh, how long have we ever met in person? I don't know. I've been trying to figure that out. Maybe, maybe <laughs> we did at Disney or something at a conference. We've been doing this for so long. So we have. And I've had your book. When did you put your book out? Uh, 2011. Do you believe wow, how long ago that's been already? Years. That's fantastic. Yeah, me and my wife are talking about revamping it a little bit and putting some new recipes and, and some other stuff into it. Because, I mean, things change. Uh -huh. I mean, the protocols and procedures don't change, but still, there's still stuff that change, and we have to keep up with the changes, especially now after, you know, COVID-19 and how is that going to look as we get into the future for restaurants yeah. and what their mm -hmm. focus is going to really be on food allergies now that they have to deal with covid um, right. So we all need to make plans to prepare ourselves as chefs and also as the consumer when we get back out into the industry and start eating in the restaurants. Definitely. And since some of the states are starting to open up, I think it's really, really important. I hope that they've thought about it previously before this, but <laughs> probably focus more on uh, how do I keep my business alive? Yeah, um, exactly. And one of the things that has crossed my mind, and I haven't really delved into it because it's probably not the most appropriate time to ask them, is, but is like all of these restaurants and people who are providing food for the frontline workers, are they actually providing options that are free of different allergens or free that are vegan options? Because I'm sure some, a lot of these frontline workers actually have those different dietary restrictions as well. Well, I don't know about you, but I've been dining out just a little bit, you know, going to uh -huh. sort of the same places we used to go and, and ordering still some of the food that we used to order is still on the menu, but many of those options have gone. There was a, v a vegan re a dish that we had at BJ's. It's no uh -huh. longer there now because they have to shrink their menu and offer the most popular items that people are right. looking for because they have less staff. Um, I mean, they don't even have like a manager on the floor. They have the chef is the manager and they wow. have someone at the cash register and then they have maybe one or two cooks and someone work in the bar. And that's pretty much it right now. So it's, it's uh, it, the focus that they have, as you said, they're really focusing on just trying to keep people, keep their doors open. Right. Right, exactly. Um, so, okay, I mentioned you briefly and I mentioned your book. So, and your allergy chefs, let's get back to you and what we're talking about. Because, sure. Not that that's not important. <laughs> I know, really. Um, but... So tell everybody um, a little bit about Your Allergy Chefs. Well, so Your Allergy Chefs, uh, we've been in uh, a consulting uh, business for about uh, 10 years now. Okay. Um, ever since we left Disney, we started, we started our own business. And, and Your Allergy Chefs is a, uh, a business to where we actually, on our website, if anybody's not gone there, we offer uh, great recipes and they're tried and true. Uh, we will not put a recipe unless it works. And, and many times we'll go back and redo the recipe to verify that they work uh, for either a chef or for a consumer. And they're free of the top nine food allergens. What's the ninth we, one? Well, the ninth one is now sesame. The okay. fair has been pushing to get sesame and they've, they've lobbied for that. And that will be the next allergen added to the list. So luckily we've been, we don't use a lot of sesame oil or sesame seeds. So we've, we use all the alternatives. So they're free of the top nine. Many of them are plant-based or vegan. And uh -huh. uh, what we also teach in the recipe is technique because we're chefs. And we want to teach people technique because I know many people right now, they're at home, they're looking at recipes, they're looking at a recipe book. But if they don't understand the technique or what, what I call recipe lingo, we try uh -huh. to 
make that simpler for people to understand what a dice is and what does saute mean, what does pan fry mean. Uh, and then we're also doing some uh, videos on uh, Facebook on Saturdays. We do a little cooking demo, 20 minutes long. Um, we just did blanching basics. So we're basically going through the fundamentals. Oh, that's pretty cool. Because that's what you need to learn. And, and that's what, I, as a chef, I've always taught fundamentals. And as I said, you can take a book and a recipe, but if you don't understand the fundamentals, how are you going to cook the recipe and make it work? Right. Exactly. And I do want to point out, I and I hope you do say this, is that you don't need your dice as perfect as you need it if you went through Le Cordon Bleu. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we don't. We don't say get the ruler out. And right. I, I, had a, I had a knife skills class and I didn't teach it. I just said, you know, this, here's an here's an easy way to cut a julienne or here's an easy way to cut a diagonal or this uh -huh. is how you can cut a dice. Again, you're at home. There are certain applications that you want to have a better cut if it's a presentation piece, but I'm not saying, well, you have to do it this way with a measure. <laughs> Forget that. I, that's, that's too much work. Sorry. Right. Exactly. Um, well, one thing just on that note on food safe, not food safety, but on food waste, um, for everybody listening and watching Joel's videos is that when you do cut the ends of carrots off or whatever, Put those in a freezer bag and put them in the freezer and then make your own vegetable stock. Sure. Yeah, yeah I have like a, what I call a stock box. Yep. And it's in my refrigerator. So, and I've used trimmings from cauliflower leaves, broccoli ends. I mean, I've created some amazing stocks from just uh -huh. not the standard. I always end up making mirepoix, which is your onions, carrots, and celery okay. as my component. So that's part of it. But then I'll throw in other parts of vegetables that I'm trimming, as long as they're not in too heavy proportion you've got some great flavored stocks. And then you can add some little other herbs or other spices such as cinnamon stick or uh, star anise or cloves if you want a different flavor, if you can maybe do an Asian dish or something. Okay, I never even thought about that. I just throw all the remnants in a bag and <laughs> put it in a bowl or put it in the pot. Um, okay, so tell me how you got started on this. And you mentioned Disney a second ago, yes. but how did you get into Disney? Cooking for food allergies and, and things like that. What did you do it? Well, I have a, um, uh, not a life-threatening milk allergy, but I've had milk allergy issues for many years, and I didn't even know it until I was like 23 and I found out. But when I went to Disney, they had a new position called the Culinary Development and Special Dietary Needs Manager, and I applied for the position. My background is a chef instructor, so I have a culinary education, so that took care of piece one. Uh -huh. I had food allergies or food sensitivities and had been lived with it all my life and understood the basis behind that. So uh -huh. I got the position to do that and ended up finding my career because it was, it was amazing working with the people at Disney. They had already been doing allergies for years, but they had no process in place. They were just sort of winging it basically. Okay. So I came in and looked at all the different things everybody was doing and worked, brought a team together of chefs and servers and managers and admins and started collecting all the data and that's when we put together this great program that's known around the world. And, and you can see from that, you know, you talk about trying to leave a legacy. And I believe this is something that I help deliver to uh -huh. help people with food allergies in the world because many companies mimic themselves after Disney because Disney is the benchmark for this. Right. And, um, and then I just got into it and just started teaching and learning more and started cooking. And, and then it's just interesting. Five years ago, Mary was diagnosed with Hashimoto's thyroiditis. Oh, wow. And she has to avoid many other allergens. I found out I can't have gluten anymore. Uh, of course, dairy. I can't have nightshades. She's allergic to wheat, sh um, scallops, and shrimp. Wow. Your S kitchen has changed dramatically. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So we're cooking. I mean, we, 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 we sort of live semi-plant-based. Um, okay. She is, for sure, or vegan. And um, that also because of health reasons, because I used to have really bad inflammation and the inflammation was due to nightshades and processed foods and sugar and salt and all that stuff. And I pretty much cleaned my system out. So now I eat a cleaner lifestyle okay. and also think of allergies. So when we develop recipes, we're thinking of not just ourselves, but we're thinking of people that may have these type of issues, but also how many recipes can we take that are comfort food and create them into an allergy friendly dish? that everybody can enjoy in the family. Because I wouldn't put this in front of someone if I didn't think my kids would eat or my, my, my wife would eat or my husband would eat. These recipes are right. like, wow, this is like a corn dog? We just did a corn <laughs> dog. That's a corn dog, really? I mean, that's wow. a great corn dog. So um, we're really passionate about creating great recipes that people can really enjoy. Plus along with training for f uh, food service companies and also product development. I was um, listening to a segment this morning with IAC, which is 
um, a venue, top 1% venues, and they had a inclusion, food and beverage inclusion session. And a, a cup, one person presented breakfast and one person presented lunch options and one presented dinner. And Chef Murray from um, Vancouver, not Vancouver, Toronto presented this, I posted it on LinkedIn, posted this really great menu that was dairy-free, gluten-free, um, halal, and he, and he, what he explained, which is, I thought was awesome, and come, you coming from Disney and, you know, group events, he's like, for the protein, I just have to replace the chicken with tofu, or I need to yep. replace it with fish, or I need to replace it with something else. Everything else was edible, you know, depending on what your allergen was overall, easily replaceable. And I think that with what you just said is key for food service people to figure out. Yeah, and that's what Disney did. I mean, the chefs, once they really started to know what was going on mm -hmm. and how they were dealing with this, they created, they started, t the chef said, let's just take our, our popular items, see how we, allergens we can remove, uh -huh. and then we can make it easier for the guests to order off the menu versus us having to create dishes because mm -hmm. we have the protocols in place. And I think that's what's important that, that chefs should do. And now that they have time to think about it before they either reopen their restaurant, it's, right. they're, they're revamping their menus. They're yeah. looking at how they can maybe grab more customers when they get to the point of reopening. So I'm hoping that this kind of information we can share with them and they can really, you know, look at, at us as ways that we can help them get their business back up and running and, and their revenue going. Yeah. I mean, so when you were at Disney, did you and you all started to make those changes? Did you see a revenue jump? Oh, yeah. I mean, it, more and more people with food allergy started coming. Okay. You know, and, and that we were tracking it year over year. And it was, we had a, a little key that said the allergy key, right? So that's how many times okay. there was an allergy uh, request. So what we did is we started tracking it year to year. And I remember when I think the first data was pulled, there was, I think about 66,000 meals for the year. Wow. When I left, it was 300,000 meals a year. So you, that was an ROI right there. People were coming. We didn't, we didn't charge for anything extra until a few years in. We started charging because we had to because the volume was getting there. And people didn't mind paying a little extra for a gluten-free bread or something that was mm – -hmm. they knew they could eat safe with their family and have a great time at the parks or the, in the resorts. Right. So I'm curious, why was that position, position created in the first place? Well, because it was getting overbearing. They needed someone to actually say, we need to get this – everybody needs to have a process. Okay. So let's get someone in here to help put, get rid of all the junk, find all the good stuff out of it, put it into a process, and then go out and train everybody. So we did the development. We got all the executives on board. The team, the people were already on board because they had to do it. Right. They had no choice. It was like, man, we need help. They just wanted help. Okay. So we, we rolled this out, and, and it was um, you know, a little challenging to begin with. But now that it's, I mean, it's been going for years, and right. um, it's, it's amazing what they and do right now they are the the cream of the crop when trying to figure that out and i know a lot of people go there for that and and margaret just said she has no problem paying extra as long as the cost is made known up front very sure. good point margaret yes um, it is yeah um but you know everybody messes up because i know you know everybody's got a bad review somewhere in their history right yeah of, of things so and, and even Disney's got some saying, oh, you know, some people have a bad experience, some people have a great experience. How do you work through that or what causes that? Well, I mean, answer to that? first, I don't know. I mean, it's about if people are taking the protocols and doing the protocols, mm -hmm. as long as they don't skip something in the process. Now, people okay. are going to make mistakes. I mean, it, it's right. unfortunately in the food allergy, you don't want to have a mistake. But, you know, I've worked in many kitchens after I left Disney, and it was always about putting one or two people in charge right. so that they really could focus on handling the guest requests and handling the production of the food. That, that eliminates the amount of chances that you may have to make a mistake. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. You know, if you have five people, that's why it's the server has to handle the conversation or the manager has to handle the conversation. But then it has to go directly to the person that's going to be either distributing the information or handling the information with the, the chef that's right. making it. Now, and I, I bring this one event up all the time when I'm talking to people, but I did an event where we were serving like seven, between four and 7,000 people for breakfast and lunch every day. And we had 683 people with dietary requests. <laughs> that sounds like a lot of fun. Yeah, totally. Um, 
and I mean, some of them were Indian, um, you know, vegetarian Indian mm -hmm. and halal and kosher. Um, I do know one day, one day we had, they were doing gluten-free, dairy-free together. And I know one day they actually served um, uh, scalloped potatoes, which ended up not being dairy-free. Mm, mm. yeah. um, a little so bit of cream was, and stuff in that one. Eggs, plenty of cream in that. But, you know, when you're doing that, I mean, I try to say, okay, let's, like you're doing, eliminate as many allergens as you can across the board. So they, they could walk through the buffet versus having 683 personal sure. plates. Yeah, and, and there are alternatives, and we've proven it in a lot of the recipes you've created. I mean, we've made all the classical sauces allergen-friendly okay. um, and vegan at the same time, and you can hardly tell the difference. I mean, most people can't tell the difference. I mean, if you make a bechamel, we use rice milk, and we use white, sweet white rice flour and okay. earth-balanced, soy-free, buttery margarine. And it comes out awesome. It's a little lighter, but when you right. add the onion and the, the cloves and the bay leaf, and then you use it as a base, to, which is, it is anyways, you can make some great dishes. So it's really about thinking beyond and going beyond that point. See, how can I do this? Especially, man, if I had that many allergens on a list, I would definitely revamp that menu a little bit. And, and I think you'd get a lot of good results. Yeah, I think so too. And it, and it, and it does, like you said earlier, help manage the kitchen and then you don't have to do all these you can easily replace something or maybe that was marisa said that earlier this morning but it eases the kitchen responsibility yeah, yes oh and yeah because instead of making two dishes you make one right exactly now um you know i when i first you and i started about the same time because thrive is 10 years old this month so which I, I thought you were around a lot longer than that. <laughs> I was, but not in my own business, but 10 years, right. yes. Okay, and then same thing when I was talking to um, Leanne from No Nut Traveler. She actually started six years ago. I'm like, really? I thought you were around a lot longer. But um, there, I, you know, when I first started, I was kind of trying to make my own blends and make my own, it, it costs a lot of money. Yes. To, to try to figure out that on your own, so you know, relying on individuals like you to help me figure that out. I mean, because it, and, and then Emily from, um, oh my gosh, food equality initiative. She shows the cost differences between regular milk and soy milk and oat milk. How do we, as a chef, how do you balance those costs out back of the house to make sure that it's not a humongous upcharge for somebody's personalized plates? Well, I think over time, well, especially now, the cost of food is starting to equalize because there's less milk available, there's less meats available. But as a chef, I mean, when you look at your menu, you can balance it out on other dishes. Okay. Right. So say I'm going to spend a little bit more on this one recipe because I have to use a different milk. Well, let me change it. And on another recipe, maybe I can tweak something here to get, control my cost because it's all an average cost anyways. Okay. So, and then you also have to look at really what is my, my business uh, need for here? Am I really getting the business in for these people that have special diets that I have to create these menus that might cost me a little more? Right. I mean, with the volume and, and if you incorporate it into other recipes on your menu, you can help balance out that cost because you may have another recipe that you can use the same sauce in and it has a higher, has a higher margin. So you can just right. incorporate it in there. It doesn't affect the, the flavor profiles of the dish, but it helps you with your cost overall. That's really smart. And, and okay, so then also talking about that, how do you, what's the ba best way for a French trained chef to think differently? And, or, uh, and I always joke, um, oh, not, not Natalie Dupree, Natalie Dupree, you're awesome. But Paula Dean and French trained chefs changing their mindset from that to this. How hard is it? <laughs> well, I think it's hard unless it really affects you personally. Okay. You know, if, if you are, have family members that start having food allergies and all these issues, you're going to maybe make those changes. But I believe with what's going on now, there's going to be a lot of different shift in how we look at food for the future. Okay. Um, you know, COVID is doing a lot of things that we never thought would happen about with the meatpacking industry and social distancing and how we look at food and how we look at ingredients. And, you know, there's been, a, there's been a movement over the last two years about going back to the basics. It's about farm to table. It's about organics. It's about sustainability. 
Well, we're showing that there's a lot of stuff that's not sustainable. So how do we get back to that? Right. Um, and it's more about clean living and clean food. So, and I've seen, I've been watching a lot of different posts and a lot of chefs that are cooking out there and they're looking at that. There's, there's a huge movement, uh, plant-based movement coming from uh, the CIA. They actually just promoted one that they're bringing all these chefs in to do plant forward foods. Awesome. You know? And it's an, I signed up for it. I said, man, I can't wait to see what they're really talking about because it's, it's important that we look at all of our industry as a whole and how we can make it sustainable for the future. Right. Right. And, and food allergies are a part of it because people living with food allergies have to be very critical about what they're eating and what they're reading on the labels, how they're yep. preparing the food, you know, how they're sourcing the food. All that is very important. And I think it's going to be a big piece. Well, and Margaret and I were talking about that last night, too, on ingredients. Am I am I gluten free gal? <laughs> um, because, you know, when you go to the grocery store and you buy your cereal, it may not be the exact same ingredients as it is when you buy it for the hotel. Yes. It has to have a longer shelf life. It's kind of think of it as buying it for Costco, right? Sure. Um, so you always have to read the labels no matter what. And so talk about talk about that food ordering from a chef's perspective from a hotel. I mean, are the systems in place for you to ask the questions and then what are the systems once you get it to, to manage? Well, it there are systems that are in place in a lot of ordering systems where you can actually tag your allergens into the order okay. itself. Okay. And you can, you can, you know, with good manufacturing practices and about getting information, you can ask your vendors to make sure that, you know, I'm looking for these specific items. I want to make sure I have them because of an allergen issue. And if you do any substitutions, I need to be alerted about it right away. Okay. But then when you receive the food, it's about making sure you identify everything properly, segregate it the way you want. If you're going to go into that steps, and I know that a lot of colleges do that. They're really uh, focused on segregating allergens and non-allergen foods, and then actually in the transportation of the food into the preparation area. Um, I did it at my last job at Concordia University. I had a certain area for my nuts and I had a certain area for dairy. And, and you can do that in a lot of your refrigeration units. And then it goes down to the handling of it. Who's in charge of handling these items? Okay. And how are you handling, handling them? How are you manufacturing or producing them in your kitchens to get them out to the service area to get them served to the guest? Um, okay. You, I mean, you just keep saying things and I have new questions for you. Um, <laughs> okay. That's good. The, um, Okay, so you've got, you've got your prep area. So some restaurants are super small kitchen spaces, right? Yep. Convention centers and hotels have bigger areas. Can you, is it realistic to think that you have a separate area in the back of a convention center or hotel that you can do allergy-free foods? Or do you just prep that food at a different time of day before everything else? Well, if you have specific items that are designated free of certain allergens and you produce those in the morning after you have your chance for your kitchen to be properly clean, okay. then you'd put that in production in the beginning and then, of course, labeling, storing them in the proper location. And then you'd go into the more allergen-based foods so that you can keep all that preparation uh, segregation proper. Mm -hmm. uh, and, but if you have to do something through the day, hopefully you have a segregated area. Like I had a small area that I could prepare foods for people with food allergies during service time. And of course, having designated equipment to cook that food at the same time. And someone designated to handle that request as needed throughout the meal period. And how do you keep in, um, because I have these meal cards. Let me see if I have one right here to show um, about, you know, when you're about to serve it out to everybody to how do you segregate the foods in the back? I know there was that one that I was talking about. It was at a big hotel and the specialty meals actually came out six hot boxes attached to a golf cart. <laughs> yes, I've done that before. Of, yeah? <laughs> yes, I've had that before at Disney. We had huge events where we had all that stuff. You'd have a separate hot box for, with a um, uh, sheet, what, your BEO sheet, your ba uh -huh. banquet order of a sheet, and right. you'd have all the allergens for those meals into that specific hot box separate. Okay. Okay. And then you'd say, okay, this is someone that would handle that. So if the, a server came up and said, I need to get, I have table 35, seat six, the person has this allergy, you'd go to that hot box and you'd pull the food from that box and make sure it verifies and, and for that dish and then the server would take it out. 
Um, so Margaret asked me this question last night, and this is probably the bane of all chefs and meeting planners, <laughs> is that last minute allergy request. Really? Or, yeah. Does that happen? I don't know if that happens. Really? I always uh, really? joke that you, like, you're causing F-bombs to go off in the kitchen. <laughs> Um, How do you deal with it? Yes. You deal with it. I yeah. mean, for, for in general, I would always have like an allergen free dish, like okay. top eight, top nine, plant based or vegan. And then you'd have, you'd have simple proteins like okay. grilled chicken, grilled fish. That's just plain. A little maybe salt and pepper. That's it. Right. So you could take some basic components and build a quick plate without having to do a whole dish. Okay. And, and uh, to me, I think that's fair when you've got a last minute request. Yes. Mm -hmm. And those people are, oh, I like what Joel's eating. I want that. <laughs> they always do. <laughs> they do. Yes, right? they do. Yeah. yeah. I remember getting that from my attendees when I was sitting down eating next to them. Um, so what, and so, I, and again, I'm referencing my talk with, with Margaret last night. Sure. Um, you know, she, we were giving advice. She asked me some, for some advice for those with food allergies when you go to an event. And I'm like, make sure that you communicate your needs on the registration form. Hopefully the meeting planner's asking you. Um, and if not, you know, call them and then call the property. Are you amenable to getting those phone calls from people? Oh, yes. I mean, I've had plenty of times where someone had to, had to talk to the chef about something specifically. Okay. Again, it's about getting that information to the chef and not many chefs are sitting in the office. Okay. Right. Right. Yep. They're out, they're out doing an event or they're busy somewhere on the line. So it's really about getting a leader or a manager to, to start the conversation and then go from there. And how do you, and I also mentioned too, when you're going to an event at a convention center, you've probably got 10 events going on at one time. Yeah. And how do you, so it is great to have somebody and would you have a different lead for each event that handles those dietary needs or just one guy per, or person? You'd you know? have a, ca you'd probably have a captain for each okay. event that mm -hmm. would be aware of the allergies because he would have the BEO also. Right. Uh, but then you'd also maybe have a sous chef or a lead cook that could manage that specific event. And then you're, we were always hooked up to, you know, any kind of banquet facility, the guy who you have a earpiece and you have your, you're walkie talkie and someone will say, Hey, I need you over at, you know, banquet hall 14. We got a special request. Can you come over and handle it? And okay. then you would probably have to get over there or send someone there to deal with it until you can get over there and talk to the guests or to handle it personally. Okay. And what you mentioned BEO, which for anybody who's not a meeting planner or hotelier, it's a banquet event order. And that's yep. what the hotel and the meeting organizer rely on with all of the details of what's going on in on the food and beverage side as well as room set and AV. Yes. And Joel, one thing that really frustrates me about BEOs um, typically is that, you know, it spells out the regular meal, the allergen full meal, right? Sure. And then at the bottom, it says 25 gluten free, <laughs> 25 vegan. Oh my God, <laughs> it drives me nuts. And you don't know what they're getting served. I want them to spell it out so I know what I'm getting served. Is that fair? Or why well, is that so hard? It, well, yes, because it could be that, like, when we did those events, you would have the main dish and how did you modify it? Right. Like, I have gluten-free this. Well, if, it's, if I have, out of 100 people, I have 25 people gluten-free, I'd make it gluten-free automatically. Okay. That would just make it simpler, right? And right. you could still make a great dish. It could be you had croutons on it. Maybe we don't do a baguette or a crouton or something. We do something else. We right. create something different that we can make it work. Um, or it could be simple modifications to that simple recipe. It could be something that's taken off. Or I have – it had sh shrimp on it, but I have shrimp allergies, so I have some made without shrimp. They may have chicken in it already. Okay. So, but to spell it out, it, yes, I would say that would be reasonable, you know, and, yeah. and the technology is getting better. And I know more people are thinking about how can we track these dietary requirements mm -hmm. and put it on a BEO. So it's clear even for the cook to know what am I doing here? What do I have to prepare for right. this menu? Because now right. I'm stuck. I have oh, I, I does chef. It doesn't tell me what I have to do here. Right. You know, what what is what are the separate dishes? And some some banquet facilities have in their back pocket. They have. These are all these dishes that we can do that cover these allergens. So it's an automatically put into this menu as an option for those guests. I think that's a smart system to have. <laughs> yes, it is yeah. a very smart system to have. Yeah. I mean, cause I think it would just ease the process across the board. Um, now 
I know you were in the cruise line business for a while. Yep. Um, I was reading an article the other day, and I think this comes back to a few minutes ago when you were talking about prepping the allergen-free meals in the morning or before you go. But it was saying, hey, we need to learn from these cruise line chefs on how to um, – what was the word that they used? How they can actually make the food last longer or, but because they're on a cruise ship for five days, they're not getting fresh food every day. Yeah. Well, you, so what really that has to deal with is a lot of your, your um, vegetables because okay. you, you order those certain vegetables in certain ripeness. Okay. So that they can say you're on a 14 day cruise. Well, you need tomatoes. Well, tomatoes, ripe tomatoes don't last 14 days. So you buy them at different stages of ripeness. So they ripen as you go through the cruise, such as like pineapples or other stuff that you want to ripen. You order it that way okay. in the production on the ship. Since it's, it's, you know, there, there's a lot, it's stainless steel everywhere. So okay. it's really easy to clean a, a kitchen because right. they have an army of people cleaning. But when it comes to the allergies, they're dealing it just like a restaurant chef would deal with food allergies. They have someone talking to the server up front. You know, you have the information ahead of time. Mm -hmm. you have the, the captain will deal with the, the guest up front, talk, oh, you have an allergy. Here's the menu. These are the modifications. And there's always, there's always a pre-order plan in place that, look, here's the menu for tomorrow. What mm -hmm. would you like off the menu? You pick those items. We'll look at how we can prepare those that fit your food allergy. Okay. And then that gets to the chef, they make their plans, they communicate what they can change and what they can't change, and then they have a great dish. And I was, took quite a few cruises with my special diets and, and my wife's, and it was amazing how well they took care of us. That's amazing. That's awesome. Yeah, it was, and it was yeah. delicious food. We and, loved it, it. and that's completely a remote experience, you know, like if you're doing an off-site event, the same kind of thing. Yeah, planning for that. Yes, okay, exactly. So, um, we've got like three minutes left. Sure. So, um, anything that you want to share with people who have dietary restrictions on how to, you know, where to get some great recipes besides your website, <laughs> share your website, um, and or, you know, best practices when going to an event? Well, first of all, you have to do your due diligence, right? You have to call ahead. You have to make plans and, and keep your expectations to a minimum, right? Don't, because I have always told chefs, that if you're going to ask someone what they like to eat, if they have a menu in, from, in front of them and you ask, what would you like to eat? They're, they want to eat anything on your menu. Right. It's always a key to say, what do you usually eat when you go out to dine? So that it gives me an idea of what I can prepare for you. Okay. It still gives a chef flexibility and creativity, but it gives them a, a guidance to go forward. So if you're going to a restaurant, have in mind what you normally eat or what you want to eat or what you can eat. And make that clear in the conversation or prior okay. to the conversation. Say, right. I usually eat grilled chicken, this, this, this. Right. And I love it. I, that's okay. I want to be with my family. I want to enjoy it. So if you have some clear direction versus saying, oh, I'd like this. Well, I can't modify that. There's too many allergens and whatever. But you have a clear idea of what you want. It'll help them come up with a decision of what they can make for you. So then what about the chef that wants to start accommodating? What, what one or two tips do you have for them to start learning to appreciate and accommodate these dietary needs to get some more business? Well, reach out for training, for one, if you haven't had any. FAIR has a lot of information on their websites, food allergy research and education for restaurants and food service operators. Come see you or me for other information about how you can manage the event and how yeah. I can train you uh -huh. to manage this and do it correctly, you know, because right. we have the experience and we have the knowledge and we're living with allergies and know what we need to, what we need to relay to them that's super important to the customer that's going to be relaying that to them anyways, and then also have an open mind. Right. Because you have yeah. to have an open mind to do this. You can't be closed-minded. You have to be like, okay, I can do this as long as I'm properly prepared. Right. And one, to the end, one chef in, Atl in Orlando, not at Disney, is like, we had three vegan people come in, or two vegan ladies come in for three days, and they had to eat off property for three days. So they mm -hmm. lost breakfast, lunch, and dinner revenue in the hotel. And they're like, oh, my God, we got to fix this. And now they're having a great time figuring out gluten-free, vegan, dairy-free desserts, and variety of other options for the menus. Yeah, and, and people won't know the difference. Right. Yep. I mean, that we've been doing this a long time, and it's come a long ways in 10 to 15 years. Like the, the products have. that are on the market are, are really good. 
Yeah. And and there, that gives you more than enough options to really create some great menus and then just use your creativity as a chef to do it, to do it right. All right. Awesome. All right. Well, tell everybody your website. Okay. It's yourallergychefs.com. Great recipes. We do Facebook on Saturdays at one o'clock, uh, little cooking demos. And, you know, anytime you need anything, just reach out to us and we're here to help you. Thank you, Chef Joel Schaefer. Oh, thank you so much, Alex. Tracy. You're welcome. And we're going to talk more offline. All right, cool. Thank you. All right, All have right, a great thanks. day. All right, bye-bye.